All right, we talked a little bit about this, clearly indicating intent. And I've captioned this, oops, that function changed my variables. Sometimes being pedantic is good because you're clearly indicating what you expect to happen. You're not indicating what you hope will happen. And you're not indicating what you expect to happen based on the code last time you looked at the function signature of the other guy who wrote the library you're using. A surprising number of bugs are found at the boundaries between library, <coughs> between functions and libraries, particularly if either somebody else wrote the other function, very common in a company, or if you're use, making use of um, other libraries, or you wrote it several months ago, you don't quite remember because it's been a while, you've done a ton of stuff in between. Sometimes you can be your own worst enemy. You may have written some good documentation. Hopefully that helped because hopefully you remembered to read it. Um, sometimes though, uh, it's surprising. You can always help with this by using some comments, but there's no promise that anyone will read them. If you, by clearly flagging, wrapping, saturating, and checked arithmetic, you make it obvious to the next person to use your code what you expect. By clearly flagging conversions with into, or try into, and not using as, you guard yourself against problems of people misunderstanding what they hand to you. And then let's have a look at this section where we look at a few ways where a bit of pedantry in the language can really save your bacon. Okay, this is a bit of C++, and we're going to play a game of spot the difference. Um, there is one character difference between the two, and the output is different from each program. Then the first one, big scary function, and I named it that because it represents a big scary function that does something. In this case, it's two lines of code, but in the real world, just pretend that this is huge and you don't quite know the inter internal details. Somebody else wrote it. So you make a string, put A in it, print that out, run the function, and then print what you've got in the string again. And the reason it prints A, A, B, A is that the string is being passed, there's no ampersand, it's not a reference. C++, this will copy it, so you're actually making a copy of the string, kind of a slow operation. But you're not modifying the original string, so the string inside the function that's a copy gets modified, the original string doesn't. Then look at the second one. We've added the ampersand. Now you're sending a reference to that string. And so when you add b to the end of that string, you're changing the original. You're not changing your copy of it. There is no copy. You've skipped the, the uh, time delay of making a copy. So arguably it's faster. At the same time, from the caller's point of view, when you're writing that main function, you don't know in any explicit way that that ampersand is there on the function signature. Because, and even worse, and I've seen this in production, Somebody else might have updated that library and added or taken away an ampersand, and all of a sudden uh, that function can change your data. They added the ampersand, and they didn't put a const in to, to uh, promise not to change it. Or uh, they take the ampersand away, and the big scary function is actually accepting a really enormous data structure. You know, oops, your whole program performance just fell apart because you will copy that whole bit of data send it to the function, and the function will work on the copy, which is fine if you're not trying to run it, you know, 60 frames a second because you're running a game or a high-performance dashboard. So intent is really, stating, clearly stating intent can save the day in this case. In C++, you can um, help a great deal by using the const keyword. If you're using C++, I strongly recommend it. Um, it will stop you from mutating somebody else's reference, you are reference to somebody else's data. Const is not the default. Um, when I'm writing C++ though, it effectively is. I just find myself writing const all the time and taking it away if I do need to make changes. It's still not great. There is a thing called const cast just in case uh, you really want to ruin people's days, but please don't use it. It is a way to take away the const tag and change things anyway. There's a lot of debate as to why that even exists. Now Go makes this a lot better. You'll notice on Go you uh, um, still are only changing one thing on the function side, so s string, s star string. But on the main side, big scary function s and big scary function ampersand s. You are clearly indicating that yes, um, I know I'm giving you a reference, yes, I know I'm giving you a copy, don't. Uh, and so you, the programmer who's writing and consuming the other person's code, has a warning that yes, I'm giving them a reference, 
Um, Go doesn't have a const keyword as far as I could tell from my reading. Um, hopefully, uh, somebody will correct me if there is one. Um, but I couldn't see a way to take a reference and promise and promise faithfully not to change it, other than writing some documentation promising to do promising to do that and hopefully keeping it. Now Rust takes this problem really seriously to the point that I've had people tell me that uh, they've hotkeyed uh, uh, buttons to type and mut over and over again for them. Um, which, incidentally, if you're doing that, you've got design problems. Shoot me an email. Um, so big scary function s and mut string. What does that mean? It means it's a reference. You're you're lending it. Mute. It's mutable. I can change it. If that mute is not there. I cannot change it. It's in the function signature. Um, so what about what happens if I just sneak that little mutt in because I want to change your data in the library? Well, it's not going to compile. Because uh, over in main, first of all, to make this work at all, oh, const does exist in Go. OK, I, uh, I, ran in, I was trying to get it to work, and I probably ran into my limits of Go knowledge, because it's a language I, it's a language I don't use much. Thank you. Let, let mute s string. So in order for string to be mutatable at all, excellent, um, you, have to de you have to declare the variable itself as being mutable. And that gives you the first layer of protection. But when you, when you lend with the ampersand, send a reference, you also have to indicate whether or not you expect that reference to be read-only or read-write with and s and and mut s. And this also ties into the borrow checker. We're going to look very quickly at uh, some um, issues that you run into with concurrent code in a moment. And this ties into that and also helps you avoid um, data races. But Rust here is being as explicit as it can, precisely because you want to avoid the problem that we saw in that C++ example, where uh, something changes and now your whole program is working differently, and you're, you spend half a day scratching your head wondering what, what happened. Hi, I'm Herbert Wolfeson, Arden Labs' Rust trainer. If you'd like to see more Rust content, click subscribe to our channel and be notified as it arrives.